Hi everyone. I thought I'd just do an impromptu painting demo while I'm working away at the studio here. I'm working on a 28 by 36 painting. Kind of trying to have a similar approach as I did with some smaller studies, but working a little bit larger scale. Is my audio coming across? Excellent, thank you. So I've done the background already on this and I've just started working on the figure today. I've got most of my colors pre-mixed on my palette, uh, which is, just makes it kind of nice to be able to paint uninterrupted. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in and I'll try to check periodically and answer them as I go. This is a 28 by 36 canvas. And all of the yellow part here is the underpainting. I've started working on the figure and I've done the background already. Yeah, sure, just a sec. Here's my palette. So I've got my mineral spirits here and the brushes that I've been using, some paper towel. Um, all of the colors that I'm using are over through here. And then these are my mixed colors. And I'm working from a photo reference on my computer off screen here. And then here's the painting so far.
Um, so I do a live painting demo for my studio once a month. Um, that's a little more organized, usually at the end of the month. And I have more information about that um, in my bio. But I was here painting today and I thought I might just, just try kind of an impromptu live demonstration. Um, so I don't really have anything planned. I'll probably just paint for the most part here. But if you have questions, please ask them. And I will check in periodically and try to answer them as best as I can. Um, so with my colors, I mix them new if I need to. Uh, but I try to keep them between painting sessions where possible. So for these colors, I had a bunch mixed um, from a previous painting that used similar colors. Uh, some of them were dry, so I had to remix them. Uh, but if the colors are dry or you know not quite the right color, then I will remix before painting. So I took probably about half an hour or so before painting today to remix my colors. Once in a while, I'm using a little bit of Gal Kid Medium. Oops. Try not to be too heavy with the Gal Kid. Um, but in areas where I want to keep the paint thin, it really helps. So for the underpainting, I like to use a bright color usually. Um, and these colors are, are fairly new to me, these really sort of fluorescent colors. Um, so I just kind of like the vibrancy that it brings uh, because I, I do end up covering up most of it, but when it peeks through in the small areas, it just, I think, brings a nice kind of um, modern approach to the painting. You know, painting a landscape and a figure, it's a very classical kind of subject. And with these neon colors, I just like how it uh, just gives this pop of color. So I've been working on smaller studies in this approach for a while, and I wanted to start kind of sizing up. So um, I did a larger painting that was similar, but not, not quite the same approach. And this one, I want to keep it fairly undetailed and try not to fuss with it too much. So I'm working on this uh, 28 by 36, which I think is just kind of a nice size to, to test the waters of bringing this approach into a bigger piece. for a moment um hopefully this won't disappear but i will come back in just a sec my phone keeps turning off so i just need to to change the settings just give me one sec and if i if it disappears i'm sorry and i will be back in 30 seconds okay 
back, and I don't think it disappeared. Excellent. Um, so I work from photographs, um, generally speaking. So I usually have a photo shoot with a model that I'm working with, and then I work from the photos um, from that shoot. So for this one, I am working from a photo reference uh, that's on my computer off screen. What I liked about this photo is that the hands are quite blurry uh, because she's moving her arms. So I kind of wanted to get that effect here as well. Now I haven't obviously worked on the hands yet, um, just because I wanted to work on the surrounding area first. So I usually tend to work from background to foreground. So with the hands in front of the figure, uh, I try to work on the arm and torso first. Oh, hello from Peru. Oh, hello from Canada. <laughs> Thank you. So even though I pre-mixed a lot of my colors, um, I can't possibly pre-mix every color that I need. So off camera, sometimes I'm just making these little um, sort of side mixtures of colors, like mixing a couple premixed colors together to make a different one. And when I do more, more formal demos, um, once a month out of my studio here, um, I have two cameras on so you can see my palette and uh, and the painting, but I just kind of thought I'd, you know, try something kind of quick and spontaneous today. Um, so yes, I do photograph my models. And then I work from the photo reference.
I'm cleaning my brush every once in a while in the mineral spirits, uh, especially if I need to switch colors or work with colors that are drastically different from each other. For anybody who's just popping in, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. In some of these areas, I'm being a little bit more careful, um, like right around kind of the upper arm and armpit area here. Um, because in in these areas, we're moving from shadow to light. So there's actually quite a bit of information that that happens there, that's being shown. Whereas in the light mass, um, or even in kind of the shadows through here, there isn't as much information. Um, so whenever we're turning from light into shadow or shadow into light, I just try to take a bit more care with those areas. Because they're really informative and they can make the figure look so much more three-dimensional, um, even if the shadows and the lights are less informative. So I just can tend to kind of slow down in those areas. Things like this can be a little quicker, but like through here, that's, you know, that's gonna show us a lot of information. Same on the other side when I get to it. I'm looking for value changes, I'm looking for color changes, um, trying to really get a sense of, of roundness and volume. So you can probably see that right here is quite a hard edge. It's quite a, um, an abrupt change. And that can be good sometimes, but this isn't the right area for it. So I'm trying to soften that edge, uh, which basically means to take kind of more steps between one color and another or one value and another. Now, an easy way of softening an edge is just to blend it. You know, just sort of blur the colors together. But I prefer to use a transition color. So to actually get a new color that will bridge those two areas. Because I find it makes the brushwork much more interesting and it makes the flesh look richer. Uh, now the canvas and background. Um, so this is linen and it was already primed with a clear primer when I bought it. So it could be painted, like you could paint directly on it. Um, I prefer painting on a white background though, and only well, not white right away, but you know, to do my underpainting on a white background um, and to paint on oil primer. So over top of the linen, I put three coats of Gamblin oil primer and once that dried, I completed the underpainting. Um, so I did the figure in this bright yellow color. And then I did the background in kind of this pink color through here. And I did part of the sort of sky area. There's not much for sky, but um, in sort of this orange color. 
through here. And I mixed those colors with Galkid medium um, to thin them out and just make sure that they uh, gripped the, the canvas um, you know, in, a, in a secure way. <laughs> Putting too much uh, mineral spirits in the paint isn't good for it um, since you need the oil in the paint to allow the paint to adhere to the ground. Usually some mineral spirits is okay, um, but with these fluorescent paints in particular, I found that even um, a modest amount of mineral spirits was too much and the paint wasn't, wasn't gripping to the ground. So once it felt dry, I could actually just wipe my finger across it and the dry pigment would come off onto my hand, which obviously is not going to work very well. Um, so for these fluorescent underpaintings, I started um, using only Galkid um, to thin the paint and to allow it to move around the canvas. So no, no mineral spirits. So it was a bit of a learning curve with them, but I quite like the effect. Okay, so here we we'll start to see how that's turning. Um, and I think it's going to work out better once I have the other side painted, of course. Um, I'm just gonna do a little softening through here. I'm keeping a hard edge up here. Let me just start moving this up a little bit. So now I'm gonna come around through here, but um, I'd like to add a bit more light to the top part of the shoulder where it's really catching a lot of light. And you can probably see in here that this more purplish paint is quite thick and heavy and you see the texture on it. But above it, where I've put some white paint mixed with a little bit of green, um, that is not very thick. And having heavier textured paint is a really kind of effective tool to have in those light areas, especially in voluminous areas as well. Um, because the actual light you know, like the ceiling lights or whatever light is shining on the painting, will catch the texture of the paint and make it look even lighter. This paint itself never emits light, of course, it only reflects light. And white paint sometimes doesn't even look light enough for something where you want it to really be bright. So what I have here on my brush is white paint mixed with a bit of the fluorescent yellow that I've used for the underpainting, just to give it a little bit of coolness and almost make it more like lighter than white, kind of. Um, and I'm just putting that more thickly on the top of her shoulder. And then with a clean brush, I'm just going to soften the area between those two colors. And now it stands out like the light is shining down onto the top of the shoulder. So then conversely in the shadows, or even like a half light here where it's not really, it's not really a shadow, but um, I try to keep the paint quite thin. And that allows some of the color of the underpainting to come through, which is, which is kind of nice to have, um, since it's, you know, the underpainting color is a very deliberate choice. Um, and also it doesn't catch as much light because it doesn't have as much texture. It allows the shadows to recede. So here I'm just moving over towards the fold in front of the armpit. Um, and I want that area to be 
quite light and fleshy, but I'm not gonna paint too much right now because I really try to stack the paint. So like I was saying earlier, if you were here, um, and newly for everybody who's joined, any parts of the painting that are further back, like the crease here, I try to paint first, and then I paint the um, lighter, kind of rounder areas last. So when working on the uh, armpit here, I'm going to start by the crease and work out. And so for everybody who's just joined, um, I do a live painting session with Q&A um, online every month, uh, so towards the end of the month usually at my studio. Um, and there's more information about that in my bio. So I just had one on January 25th, which is fun. And for those ones, I have a camera on my palette as well. And it's a little more, it's a little more structured. Um, for today, I was painting, I just thought I'd kind of do an impromptu live session or live demo. Um, so I only have the camera on my painting. Uh, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask and I'll kind of take a look periodically and see if any questions have come up. And if at any point the video or audio is not working very well, please let me know. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep going without knowing that. So here also, I'm trying to get a really hard edge at the fold so that we get this soft fleshiness around it, but we really see that these are two separate areas of the body. Uh, now for my palette for colors, it's, it's quite an extensive list for this particular painting. Um, usually I have a smaller, kind of tighter palette, um, more of a limited palette, but for these ones, I've been using quite a quite a range of colors. Uh, so I'm using Gamblin Titanium, oops, Gamblin Titanium White. See, I've dragged some of the dark paint into the light area here, which is not what I wanted. There we go. Uh, so Gamblin Titanium White and Gamblin Cadmium Orange. Um, Gamblin, Oh gosh, there's a whole bunch. But for the skin, actually, I'm mostly using Gamblin Titanium White, Gamblin Cadmium Orange, um, Windsor and Newton Purple Lake, uh, which I really like, and Windsor and Newton um, Cadmium Green Pale. Um, so those are kind of the four colors I'm mostly using for the skin. I'm also using some Quinacridone Red, uh, cadmium Red Light, Raw Sienna, Sap Green, um, Indian Yellow, Cadmium Yellow Light. There's, there are quite a, quite a few. I usually work with more primary colors. Um, but I was doing a painting residency in Newfoundland in October, and when I came back home, I shipped all my paint back to BC from Newfoundland, which is a very, very long way. Um, and so I arrived well before my paint did, and I wanted to get some painting done, but my normal palette was still in the mail. I didn't want to buy a whole new set of paint, when I knew mine was arriving in a couple weeks. So I just kind of used the colors that I had already in my studio, which uh, were not the colors that I was familiar with or that I really enjoyed using generally. Um, so that's all, all of these colors. But because I had to use them for a couple weeks and I was practicing painting uh, with them, it actually worked out really, really nicely. And I, I kind of grew to very much enjoy these colors. So instead of using primary colors like I'm normally using, I use all these secondary colors, this orange, green, and purple. Uh, but I think they work. It's kind of nice sometimes to you know, have these limitations and really try new things because of that. 
Yes, it's definitely a happy inconvenience. <laughs> and I'll be back in a sec. I'm just going to get the paper towel. So again, like I was explaining earlier, if you were here or if you weren't here, I'll explain it again, uh, that I try to be much more careful in the half lights and the turnings. So where the light turns into shadow or the shadow turns into light. So right about here, basically. In order to get a greater sense of roundness and volume. So the light mass uh, which will be kind of through here, and we see some of it through here. Um, those areas I'm usually kind of less careful um, because they don't need to be super informative. You know, too much information in the lights or the darks can almost look false because the eye can't pick up that information if there isn't enough light or if there's too much light. But when there's a nice medium amount of light, like in the half lights or the turnings, we see more surface texture. So those are the areas to really pay attention to and, and take a little more time with. So I'm starting to turn out of the half light now. This edge, though I wanted it to be a hard edge, it's a little bit too sharp. It's a bit too hard. So I'm going to use a soft sable brush, a really old one. It's quite worn down. And going to gently add a little bit of this warmer color along the edge. And see how that just took the, the sharpness out of it? Um, it's still, it still turns nicely, but it's not as abrupt. And then I'm going to build up the light a little bit more at the top. When I see I was asked where I buy my colors, I usually buy them from um, Opus Art Supplies, which is a uh, local art supply store. It's all across my province, BC. Um, now, I know they ship across Canada, but I don't know internationally or not. Um, but Gamblin and Willi or, oh, Williamsburg, I use them a lot too. But um, Gamblin, Windsor Newton, Williamsburg, they're all fairly common paint companies, art supply companies. So I think they're usually probably not too hard to find. So 
If you have questions, feel free to ask. And if you've already asked and haven't answered, just uh, ask again because I probably missed it. So the first color I put down was a bit too dark. So I'm just mixing a little bit of a lighter color through here and then using quite a big brush because um, I really didn't, I really want, I want to keep this painting from being too detailed and too fussy. Um, so again, I'm keeping a bit of fussiness for those, those turning areas, um, but trying to keep anything else quite Know, like simplified almost and just loose and keeping a nice energy with it. Now, I've never actually used water mixable oils, so I can't really comment on them from you know first hand perspective. Um, I know some of my students have used them, a couple of my friends have used them, and uh, they do seem to have a different texture than regular oils. Um, but I, I don't really know myself. I think they're a great option uh, for anybody who is sensitive to solvent. Um, but you can also paint without solvent too, like with regular oils. But it's easier cleanup, for sure. I think the most important thing is just to paint, right? So if water mixable oils makes it easier to paint, then use those. But yeah, I've, I've never tried them myself. Have you tried them? Do you like them? So here's a similar approach, really trying to work from background to foreground. Um, starting with the, the beginning of a the shadow, there's going to be quite a lot of shadow through the neck here, and I'll shift things over as I go. Um, this is the highest point, or the lightest point anyways, in this area, so I've painted this last. Now this brush I'm using here is a synthetic brush and it's quite precise and flat. Um, and I don't often use, or haven't often used synthetic brushes. Um, but get, again, with these smaller studies, I'll bring one over to show you, I've, I've really been enjoying them. So um, in trying to keep that, that small study kind of energy going into these this mid-sized piece, I thought I'd try to use basically the same brushes. I got, I got one that was bigger, um, which made more sense. But 
but they are quite precise and normally I don't like that as much, but I, I'm enjoying it for these. Here's one of the smaller studies. So this is actually the same pose as this one that I'm doing. I know the face looks a bit strange when it's just an outline, um, but this is the same pose, but I'm just working on it bigger because I, I liked working on it so much. Just, oops, adjust the camera a little bit. Something I really liked about or am enjoying, not, not past tense, but like about working on these paintings when it's outdoors, um, is that I really get a sense of a cool light and a warm shadow. So as I move into these more shadowy areas, it's just a great opportunity to play with the color temperature. And there's also so much green in the skin just being um, you know, reflected from the trees and the kind of forest area around it, around her. And I think there can be this really nice sort of shimmering effect of having warm and cool colors next to each other. So here I really tried to soften that edge, which was quite hard, quite abrupt at first, um, with transition colors. So there's these little subtle color changes, not just value changes. And that helps to make it look more interesting and more real. And it reinforces the, the volume, the form, because we're seeing that form being represented not only with value changes, but also with color temperature changes.
If you have any questions at any point, feel free to ask. Again, really thinking about working from background to foreground. So working towards the lightest lights. And towards the high points. I'm trying to simplify the brush strokes where possible, so to not get too fussy with them um, where I can, but not to simplify the colors too much. So to look for these subtle color changes and add them as, as I work through them. I haven't noticed that my white's yellow over time. Um, not, not to my eye anyways, not noticeably. I mean, I've done some research about different whites and you know, I've seen people's experiments, um, you know, putting different, different whites on a piece of canvas paper and just leaving it over time. So I have no doubt that whites do yellow sometimes. Um, I haven't... I haven't noticed it anyways in my own work. Not yet anyways, so touch wood. <laughs> I'm kind of excited to get to these blurry hands, um, but when working into an area that is complicated or difficult or when I'm not sure how I'm going to work on it, I really try to work on the surrounding area first. So by the time I get to the difficult part, there's lots of information around it uh, to compare back to and to help inform my decisions. So really, generally, I work on the easy parts first and then kind of towards the harder parts. I'm also giving a free demo that will be more organized and structured than this um, on February 18th, I believe, through Opus Art Supplies. So it's online and anybody can join. Um, you do have to register first if you, if you want to join. Um, so there's a link in my bio for that. And I'll be talking about mixing skin colors and skin tones. Um, so if you like painting demos, that might be... Nice one to join. I do like working in working in sections like this because each like I said each area helps inform the next. I can compare colors here to the colors around, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, now sometimes I'll do a second pass. So this is this is the first pass right now. Uh, it's the first coat of paint besides the underpainting. 
but in keeping this approach of almost a study and trying to keep it really like fresh and and have this energy to it um, I'm going to try not doing a second pass unless there's any areas that I really don't like or you know clearly need more development Okay, so here all around the turning, I've been taking a little more care um, to get the change in values and in colors. But now that I'm working towards the light mass, um, I'm going to work less carefully and with a bigger brush. So it's just gonna take a moment because I need to mix a bit of paint here. I'm using titanium white with a little bit of uh, Windsor Newton Purple Lake for the most of the lights, not the lightest lights, but the second lightest lights. So that's what I have on my brush right now is um, titanium white and a bit of Purple Lake. But then in the lightest parts of the lights, I'll use titanium white and the fluorescent yellow that's in the background. So that is, um, here we go, Cama, I don't know if you can see that actually, but uh, Cama pigments in fluorescent yellow. So that's the color I use for the uh, underpainting. And sometimes I've been mixing a little bit into uh, the lightest lights and other parts of the painting, but I'm trying not to rely on those fluorescent colors too much in these final coats of paint, like in the, in the first and or second pass, um, because they're not entirely light fast. Um, so light fast paint retains its color over time and in the sun. Um, and I usually try to use only light fast paints, but these fluorescent colors are not light fast. So when there's just little bits poking through, um, like in the background, these little tiny pieces, I'm not, I'm not too concerned about that, but I don't want to really rely on them for, um, you know, the actual opaque paint here, because I'd like the painting to be able to be displayed wherever you know, even if it is in a very sunny location, and feel confident that the colors are going to last and remain consistent. So I'm using the fluorescent colors a little bit um, in my, my paint mixtures here, but not, not a whole lot. And yeah, the blending does seem to be kind of an every brush stroke. Like I try not to, not to do too much blending. Um, so when I think of blending, I mean more like, as an example, if I were, I'm, I'm not actually gonna, well, I'll do a little bit of it, but if I were to take a brush and just kind of mix the colors together with many repetitive little brush strokes to, to soften an area and to kind of mix those together. I try not to do that too often, though sometimes that is the right call, uh, because I find it can make the colors muddy and it doesn't really provide a rich turning of form. Um, so I do try to soften colors into one another as I paint, uh, but generally speaking, once if they're painted, I'll leave them alone. Um, and I'm using transition colors. Um, so shifting colors and shifting values and temperatures as I go and that tends to um, create a more interesting approach and interesting look. Um, so now I am actually going to do a little bit of, of true blending though with um, this old sable brush because the edge here is just a little too hard and I did want a sharp edge. I do like a sharp edge where 
uh, creases happen or forms meet. Um, but that's, that's a bit too much for me. So I'm taking a little bit of paint um, of just a slightly kind of warm beigey brown color. Um, I also want to change the form a little bit here. And I'm just gently adding that to this hard edge. So I'm kind of blending but adding a different color at the same time. And then that just helps it recede a little bit. I'll just smooth out the form here. So then it's not just mixing together what's there, you know, even what I did there, like it is still blending, but I'm also adding to it. I'm just gonna shift the camera a bit here because I'm excited to get to the complicated part of the hands. We'll see how this goes. So I'm going to keep these areas kind of blurry because um, that's what I liked about them. And not overdo it. Um, but also keep, you know, something of a structure so it's not just messy. Actually, actually before I do that, I'm just going to pull the camera, whew, there we go, pull the camera back a bit just so you can see how this is starting to come together. So I realize the camera's kind of trying to adjust to the lights. Oh, come on, there we go. So that's kind of what I'm working with at the moment. So right now I am using a bristle brush, uh, not a synthetic brush, because it is a little more textured and less precise. notice is sometimes the parts of the painting that look the most casual are actually the most difficult to paint because if you paint them in a really casual loose way they just look messy. So a loose approach is an effect in my opinion not um, you know, not how the painting is created, if that makes sense. Yeah, hands can be tricky. I, I really enjoy painting hands, but they're they're not easy. I just find doing them again and again helps. Um, this is going to be a bit tricky though because they are hands, but they're so blurry. Um, and hopefully, I'll get a sense once I finish this area. If that if that happens today, we'll see how long this takes. Um, so, you know, I want to get the sense of hands, but not necessarily have them, have each detail spelled out. This 
is also an area where I want to keep some of the underpainting showing too. Just gives a sense of transparency and I think adds to the color complexity as well. If any questions at any point, please feel welcome to ask. I'm starting to get some of the structure of the blurry hands. It's maybe a little hard to tell right now. <laughs> Using right now an old sable brush. It just has sort of a nice soft texture, but it's also fairly imprecise too, which works nicely for this. For anybody who's just joined, um, I often do a live painting session once a month, um, usually at the end of the month, from my studio, um, and that's, that's online and anybody can join. Um, but I thought I would do today just a kind of an impromptu live painting session. Um, so normally in the, in the more structured painting sessions that I do, um, I have a camera on both my palette and my painting, but I'm, I'm just doing this on my phone so I only have the camera on the painting. But you're welcome to ask 
questions, if you have any, I will do my best to answer them. I'm painting these blurred hands. Um, I'm trying to keep the hand structure in mind, but also just trying to paint shapes and colors and just put those shapes and colors in the right places because they should work out that way. So I'm getting there. I'm going to have some work to do on the wrist area to get that, that motion to continue through the arm. Um, but you can start to get a sense of what it looks like. And also I think where it's going to need a little bit more work too. So I'm going to kind of work on this area and then I'll probably wrap up from there. And we'll see how See how this part works out though. Okay, I was saying before, if anybody was here earlier, sorry if it's repeated, um, but sometimes these parts that look really casual, you know, like the blurred hands here, are not necessarily casually painted. The loose effect is quite controlled in the approach to painting it, actually. Um, because if I just kind of blurred a bunch of paint here, 
then we wouldn't have any structure. And without the sharpness and detail, any structure that is visible um, is extra important in order to know what's going on there. So once I paint this little area, again, I'll leave this part for later, but I'll be able to see how it's coming together and where it might need more work. And I like to keep the chroma or the intensity of the color um, quite high in the hands and especially the fingers too. So I might end up adding a few more little pops of color through here. Okay, so I'm just going to step back and kind of get a sense of the movement there. So you can see where it's going. Um, I'll probably do a couple little touch-ups, but I don't think I'm going to fuss with the hand too much more because I don't want to get it all blended together or blurry. Uh, well, it is blurry, but you know, get the, the colors all blended together. And the back of the hand and the wrist and the forearm are a very important part of creating that sense of movement. So I don't want to put too much judgment on what this looks like yet until I have more of the area established. Um, but stepping back here, I see that you know the edge of the hip here is quite a hard edge, so I'll probably soften that off at some point. Um, but hopefully you get a sense of where the, where the painting's going and kind of the general gist of it. So I think I'll wrap up with that for now. Um, but if you have any questions, um, please let me know and I can answer them in the next couple minutes here. And if you do like painting demos, I have a free demo, more structured and organized than this one, uh, coming up on February um, 18th through Opus Art Supplies. Um, so there's a link for that in my bio. Anybody can join and it is free. You just need to register for it. And once a month, um, I do a live painting session and Q and A, um, that I host on zoom. So that again is a little more structured because I'll have a, um, a camera say on my palette, um, and on my painting. Uh, so thanks so much for being here, and um, I hope that you enjoy it. Take care. Bye-bye.